I think that I misunderstood the advertising for this movie. This year marks 100 years since the founding of the Walt Disney Corporation. They created Alice's Wonderland, and then a short series of Alice in Wonderland inspired shorts before moving on to properties that are now iconic. In the advertising for Wish, I got the feeling that they were shooting for something that would be a culmination of the first hundred years of the company. If that was the goal for this movie, Sophia, the first did it better. Moving from that concern to the next, you could also feel the recent writer's strike in this movie, in particular in the songs. There was at least one set of lyrics in every song where I had to ask myself, did that rhyme? And would conclude, that didn't rhyme, and it didn't really fit the beat either. If they were having that much trouble with the music, Disney missed a golden opportunity to have a non-musical drama. So it's not Disney's best work. But Disney tends to set the bar pretty high. It's an okay movie, in the grand scheme of things. I think that the hype it got set higher than standard expectations, and people were extra disappointed when it was a somewhat lower than standard movie. I don't think it's as bad as some others seem to think it was, though. One of the driving plot points in this movie is that King Magnifico hides the wishes of the people, only granting a few so that everyone can be happy. When the main character, Asha, finds out that her grandfather's wish to inspire others will never be granted, she is disappointed enough to start a rebellion. She says that if Magnifico won't grant the wish, then at least her grandfather should have it back to try to make it come true on his own. You see, when they gave their wish to Magnifico, they forgot the wish. This makes them docile and easy to control. Without anything to motivate them beyond their love for king and country, everyone cooperates and obeys and falls in line. This is a major strategy of many oppressive regimes. Take away people's hope and then force them to obey. It's just not usually so literal. However, there is a point to Magnifico's concern. When he looks at a wish for something vague, like creating something to inspire the generations, there is an easy road and a hard road. The hard road is to seek something real, substantial, and peaceful that will inspire the generations. The easy road is to appeal to people's appetites and passions. Make them afraid, make them angry, or make them horny, and you'll have them eating out of your hand. They'll be inspired to revolution, violence, and debauchery. If all you want is to inspire, without more specifics, then that's the quickest way to it. My wish is to find the most authoritative source text for God's inspired word. I think I have for Matthew in Hebrew. The problem is, my most authoritative text isn't enough different from the standard text to really drive people. I can't make them scared, because they can be saved just fine with the standard Greek texts. I can't make them angry, because there's no conspiracy to hide the original from them, just a bunch of assumptions that I disagree with. I can't make them horny because, well, it's the gospel and just like the version of Matthew everyone else is familiar with its intent on Christ's followers exercising self-control. So I'm pretty sure I'm right but I'm not sure I'll ever inspire anyone else to believe me. I'll put my evidence on my blog and I'll see if I can get it published in an academic journal in a few years, and then I'll have peaked. And I've come to terms with that. What if I hadn't, though? How far would people really be willing to let me go in my pursuit to be recognized as the one who discovered or rediscovered the authentic Hebrew text of Matthew? Could I start my own church filled with faithful followers that focused on the Hebrewness of Matthew? Could I tell those followers that everyone else was doomed to some kind of purgatory for failing to recognize the truth about Matthew's gospel? Could I tell them to destroy Bibles that were made from the wrong sources? Every step in fear and anger would leave them more committed to the things I was telling them. At what point is it too much? For me, I've decided not to take even a single step down that road. Everyone agrees that there is something that's too far, but it's really hard to get people to agree on what that is. Westboro Baptist Church protested funerals of people they disagreed with. I think that was wrong and should not have been allowed. 
Others say that since they didn't hurt anyone physically or cause any property damage, it's no big deal. Most often, it is a person's alignment on the issues they were protesting that tell you whether they think it's too far or free speech. If someone is right aligned politically, then it's free speech because the only damage is emotional, and if they're left aligned, then emotional damage is damage enough. Yet when Phi Kappa Psi was protested for several days, as a result of a false accusation, the defense I've heard from the left aligned people is that they didn't cause any property damage and you can't quantify damage to reputation, which is the same as Westboro Baptist Church's emotional damage. While I think that both were wrong, I found it's very difficult to find people who won't defend one or the other. If it's okay for your allies to be sincerely wrong, why isn't it okay for others to be sincerely wrong? Everyone is willing to silence the one who inspired their enemies but no one is willing to silence their allies even when those allies have hurt others. I don't claim to know what the answer is. I know that going to the extreme of Magnifico, taking away the hope of those who are too vague and too disorganized and otherwise too dangerous just because they're a threat to establish power is wrong. Yet our human tendency to support those on our team even when they're wrong and even when they hurt people makes unchecked inspiration problematic as well. There was a time when I thought more information would be the solution because I thought the problem was just that people couldn't easily check their feelings. I was wrong. Now even when the information is freely available with a quick query to Google, we still fall into the trap of saying that our side is always right and the other side is always wrong. I would like to run an experiment. This experiment depends on you, dear reader. If you are reading this on Facebook or YouTube, Please go to my WordPress blog. Facebook and YouTube have taken our wishes away, and I'm normally okay with that. However, for this experiment, it's a little problematic. WordPress doesn't need to take our wishes away yet, so we can do this there. Once you are on the WordPress blog entry for this blog post, write a comment about who your people are, be that your political party, your church, your family, or whatever else you most identify as. Then finish your comment on behalf of your people for something that one or some of your people have done that has hurt others. It doesn't have to be recent, and you don't have to have been personally involved, but it has to be someone that your opponents would expect you to defend for being part of your group. Of course, you'll condemn them. Explicitly is nice, but if you list it, I'll interpret that as you condemn them unless you give me reason to think otherwise. Let's avoid naming the individual. If names are necessary to clarify the event, then name the place, and if possible, the heroes that helped. Only use the name of the perpetrator if it's necessary. The experiment is simply this. What kind of people are the most willing to admit their failures as a group? Is it Democrats or Republicans? Christians or humanists? This country or another? It will be interesting to see. Of course, I need to go first, and this gives Christians the edge right off the bat. On October 8, 2022, an Oregonian Christian attacked a transsexual employee of the local library in Boise, Idaho, as a part of a week-long crime spree targeting LGBT plus people with violence. As a Christian, I condemn and renounce him and sincerely apologize to his victims and those who have suffered under that or any similar assailant. You next. What have those that would claim you as an ally done that you condemn? Or is it just Christians like me that can do this? Is it only Christians that would be willing to give even their potential enemies their wishes? Or are there other groups as well?